All right. So as I mentioned, we decided to start off a series of short didactic lectures for SC Consult in which we're going to consider medication options for a variety of substance use disorders. I'm going to spend hopefully not more than 15 minutes or so today talking about medications for alcohol use disorder. Alcohol use disorder, which I might say, I might abbreviate as AUD when I speak about it as I go forward, very common and very tragic condition. I was a bit surprised by this number. Uh, one quarter of US adults report at least one episode of binge drinking in the past month. 5% is toward the lower end of the estimation of prevalence ranges. Ranges I've seen numbers um, up to 10%. But from the NIAA website, according to their 2019 data, they are saying that about 5% or one in 20 adults has an alcohol use disorder. And many of them have kids, one in 10 United States children live with a parent with alcohol use disorder, which is tragic on many levels, not the least of which is the um, are, are the emotional tolls of living with uh, alcohol with a parent affected by alcohol use disorder and all the illnesses and traumas that that can entail, but also the average, on average, the shortening of lifespan by alcohol is about 29 years and about 95,000 or close to 100,000 people die from alcohol, alcohol related, die from factors related to excess alcohol use. It's something that I'm sure everybody knows and probably has been touched by in some fashion. And we all probably know that the response to noticing somebody with alcohol use disorder is to get them into quote unquote treatment. Uh, treatment is usually defined as, or usually seen as a kind of based on a 12 step approach. Some of them don't rely exclusively on that, but we can say broadly, the major focus of alcohol use disorder treatment has been psychosocial and that well, response, no matter if it's just psychosocial or otherwise, is, shall we say, inconsistent. Many people don't get a whole lot of benefit from whatever treatment is recommended. And I always think that when we see variable response, so if you, in other words, if you see 10 people with identical symptoms and three of them get better from a particular treatment, but seven of them don't, then this might be nature's way of telling you that the thing, the symptoms that you're looking at have a number of different underlying causes. So for in this hypothetical example, the three out of 10 people that did get better from let's say 12 step based psychosocial treatment had the cause of their alcohol use disorder probably had something very relevant to the things that psychosocial or 12 step treatment addresses. But for the people who don't respond to that, maybe they have some other things going on. A curious and to me disturbing trend in, well, actually all of medicine, more so in psychiatry and most so in substance use treatment programs is that when we see patients that aren't responding to the recommended treatment, we tend to blame the patient. They are resistive. They are not ready. They are um, whatever, you know, it, it it's, seems to be, and I've, I've witnessed treatments for alcohol and substance use disorder for most of my career. So <laughs> speak from experience, it seems to me like the reflex is to, uh, is to ascribe treatment failure to failures of the patient and not to failures of the program or failures of our ability to understand the causes of the condition that we're essentially trying to treat and to be um, flexible in our thinking and open-minded in shifting our thinking uh, mm -hmm. to try to match appropriate treatments to um, people in particular needs. Most of the psychosocial or spiritual or 12 step based programs are revolving around concepts of alcohol use disorder that view it as a crutch or as a way to escape or solve psychological or emotional tension. And it's frequently to bring, it's frequently brought up this idea that people with substance use disorders are self medicating. So they have some kind of emotional pain and they're using a substance to correct or, or ameliorate the, the pain of the of the unwanted emotion. I think a bit underemphasized in still dominant treatment models is that substance use disorders in general and alcohol use disorder is included in that might revolve around brain systems that are overly activated toward reward 
or reinforcement, or that may be underactivated um, in response to aversive consequences. So for example, some data say that people with alcohol use disorder are significantly less likely to experience hangovers or hangovers of a similar intensity versus people who don't develop an alcohol use disorder. Similarly, people with alcohol use disorder, I mean, I've heard I've heard them, I've heard many of them say this along the lines of when I took my first drink, it was unbelievable how good I felt. So um, that would be a sort of narrative way of, of expressing reward systems that are overly activated. And uh, related to these reward or aversion abnormalities is consistent signal that the ventral part of the striatum, which is an area of the brain which links behavioral repertoires to environmental situations, is overactivated um, or is overactive. So the, according to use on based on that neurological data, um, a, when a person encounters a, a cue, an environmental cue or a thought, um, that ventral striatum system goes and picks out the programs that are devoted to seeking substance and using substance in a way that's a bit automatic or, or can feel like a compulsion. And um, overlaid or interwoven with these four bullet points is that the excitatory glutamate neurotransmitter system is acting not in tandem with the inhibitory breaking system of, of GABA neurotransmitter systems. So if, if we accept the idea that alcohol use disorder is multifaceted, then we should be looking at, you know, multiple multifaceted or multimodal treatment. Um, as I said, most of alcohol use disorder treatment these days still revolves around uh, concepts that were developed in the 1930s that are, in, you know, enshrined in the 12 step philosophy. And despite the fact that we have three FDA approved medications, two additional ones, which the American Psychiatric Association recommends, and several more, which have very promising leads in the medical literature, not a whole lot of people with alcohol use disorder are given the benefit of medication treatments. Uh, this is a bit old, but at least from my experience, I'd, I'd be surprised if the number budged much higher than less than 10% of people with alcohol use disorder being offered approved treatments as a way to assist or um, assist their recovery or to maximize their chances for treatment success. I mentioned the FDA. So we have FDA approved medications that can be used in conjunction with other forms of treatment to increase the odds of successful remission of alcohol, of problematic alcohol use behaviors. My own, I, I'm a dues paying member, uh, American Psychiatric Association actually has a practice guideline, which is free for anybody to look up and read in its entirety. And they also mention, I mean, citing a fair abundance of scientific literature uh, supporting the use of topiramate or gabapentin. So we have a total of at least five medicines which can be thought about and a few more if you dig deeper into science literature. Of what the APA says, they, they for, for reasons that are very good and, and will become apparent later on in this talk, um, acamprosate and naltrexone or naltrexone are the first line agents for people with moderate to severe alcohol use disorder who do wish to cut down or stop drinking, um, who either prefer a medication or have not responded to non-pharmacological interventions and have no contraindications. So fairly straightforward. I'm going to talk in the interest of time, um, limit the discussion to the big three, the FDA approved ones, naltrexone and camprosate and disulfur disulfuram, starting with naltrexone. And again, because I'm trying to limit time, I'm going to highlight some interesting bullet points and cannot possibly cover all of the details. And I'm not going to delve into in detail about side effects and risks. Anybody considering this, <clears throat> either to prescribe it or to use it, needs to do their due diligence about, I mean, to read the prescribing information and understand the, the full ins and outs of the medicines. Now, Trexone, to start with, it's a it's an antagonist of opiate receptors. The opiate receptor family has three subtypes. Uh, mu and kappa are the ones with primarily mu being the one that's um, blocked by naltrexone. Opiate, the endogenous opiate system and consisting of endorphins or encephalins are involved in these brain circuits that mitigate reward or pleasure. Um, or reinforcement. So when we do something that the brain thinks is going to be useful for our survival, 
then it gives us a nice little neurological signal to try to get us to do more of it. So, and dopamine and opiates, dopamine and the endogenous opiates are um, key neurotransmitters in those circuits. And naltrexone blocks one of those pathways or several of them. Interestingly, Naltrexone doesn't get a lot of use from my discussions with clinicians. There's the idea that it doesn't work very well, but I, th many would argue, and I think that there's a lot of validity to this argument that we tend to prescribe naltrexone in not the best way and look for not the, not the right outcome. So tons of animal studies and actually a fair number of human studies suggest that naltrexone works best when it actually is inhibiting reward signals for alcohol. So in other words, the conventional US way is take a naltrexone pill or a long injection and don't drink. And if you do drink, you're considered a treatment failure. The smart way, <laughs> the, the smart way of doing it is give a person naltrexone say, try not to drink. But if you do continue to drink, do keep taking your medicine and um, just 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 keep taking the medicine regardless of whether you drink or not and try to drink less if that's what you desire. That works better. There's a drug called nalmefine, which is very similar to naltrexone in Europe. It's actually approved kind of with that thought in mind. Take it two hours before you plan to drink, try to drink less, or maybe change your mind and don't drink at all. But it's uh, the idea is that if we block the opiate receptors when they're being activated by alcohol, then this kind of Pavlovian classical association between alcohol and reward has a chance to become extinguished. And animal data and human studies suggest that that works reasonably well. Um, this, this European dosing scheme is actually part of what's called a Sinclair method in which we use the US available agent naltrexone and instruct people to take an hour before drinking and let extinction occur. Not a I mean, either way, whether to take it, try not to drink or take it before drinking and try not to drink. I, you know, as long as it results in less drinking and a chance to continue adherence to treatment programs, which can more comp comprehensively address the issue, I think it's probably a good thing. Also to that business about naltrexone doesn't seem to work. It may be because a subset of people who get naltrexone will have great results and some won't. And we're for like 20 years ago, genetic studies were finding that people that have higher sensitivity versions of the opiate receptor are probably more likely to be therapeutically responsive to naltrexone. More recent from this one from 2020 suggests that if we look at three genetic markers, <clears throat> the opiate receptor and a couple of them related to dopamine signaling, we can actually see, you know, we, we can see much stronger results from naltrexone. So this is one portion of the study by Anton and colleagues from Medical University of South Carolina. We're looking here at the combination of opiate receptor G allele and the valval um, carriers at the COMT gene. So COMT is a dopamine metabolism enzyme. OPRM1 is the opiate receptor. And uh, carriers of both of these, um, we'll call them more sensitive alleles, uh, have actually a much better response to naltrexone. Here we're looking at percent of heavy drinking days, uh, percent of days in which a person re reports heavy drinking for up to four months. And you'll see consistently versus placebo, naltrexone gets good results. By four months, it's less than 5% of days are considered heavy drinking versus a placebo group that had a nearly 40%. So we're inching toward being able to better understand who are going to be therapeutic responders to naltrexone. And um, that combined with knowledge of how to most effectively use it will probably stimulate more interest in using naltrexone. Um, next one, a camprosate, very interesting drug, very difficult to explain mechanistically. It um, appears to both reduce glutamate signaling at the NMDA receptor. So it reduces the um, activity or the tone of the excitatory system of the brain. And at the same time, it works as what's called an allosteric modulator, a GABA-A, um, which is reminiscent of the way that benzodiazepines or alcohol would work. So it, it augments GABA signaling at the same time that it attenuates glutamate signaling. And the idea, all this language is a bit fuzzy, so I apologize, but, um, 
I like to put it simplistically, is, is that we see in heavy drinking that there is a generally an overactivity of glutamate and underactivity of GABA because of upregulation and downregulation of uh, these receptors. And interestingly, glutamate overactivity is fairly consistently found in um, studies of craving. So that may be one of the pathways to sustaining problematic alcohol use. Uh, bottom line, the camprosate can do both. It can reduce glutamate tone and augment GABA tone. And uh, consistent with, the, uh, with this idea is that this very interesting study from 2015 showed that if you measure glutamate in the blood, then those people that had higher glutamate tended to be better acamprosate responders. And as acamprosate response was, was continuing, you saw glutamate levels falling. And in the non-responders, they had normal glutamate and, and stable glutamate levels. So like in naltrexone, I believe we're maybe inching toward some biomarkers that can help to identify responders to this medicine. Um, also very intriguing stuff with camprosate in, um, in a study that was cited by Mason in 2021, uh, one year after treatment of camprosate, then um, people still had a um, substantially reduced rate of drinking versus the group that had gotten placebo. Um, I've certainly, I, I've, I've witnessed this, or at least my patients in my practice have told me about this, that it helps to get their sleep back on track. And again, purely anecdotally, I've heard from patients for whom I prescribed a camprosate that they, they feel that it helps to alleviate some anxiety and tension. And attractively to a camprosate is not metabolized in the liver, doesn't have any appreciable liver toxicity, neither can be said for naltrexone or disulfiram, and, and conveniently minimal drug-drug interactions. Inconveniently, a camprosate has to be taken three times a day, and um, that's a basis of major drawback in my view. But um, in my personal opinion, a potentially worthwhile and decidedly underutilized medication. And disulfiram, the, uh, the first one that we had since 1951, approximately, in the United States to treat alcohol use disorder. I think most people know the story. It inhibits the enzyme. It inhibits one of the enzymes involved in alcohol metabolism, causing a buildup of an alcohol metabolite called acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is part of the reason why we experience hangovers as we do. Um, and when acetaldehyde, when acetaldehyde levels are substantially higher, you get a whole, a whole slew of really awful body sensations, including flushing headache, nausea, vomiting, palpitations, dyspnea, hypotension, uh, like every organ system that can be affected seems to be affected. And this is intensely uncomfortable and can progress to being very medically serious and occasionally fatal if people have been given like a whole lot of disulfiram and exposed to a whole lot of alcohol or in people who are just for whatever reason, genetically sensitive. So for that reason, plus the fact that it does um, create irritation of liver and there have been reports of, um, of fatal hepatitis as resulting from disulfiram, it has not a lot of lovers in the medicine recommending world and uh, APA guidelines. Nobody recommends it as a first treatment, but it's an option to consider. Um, interesting stuff, and a lot, by the way, not that disulfiram needs, I, I'm not going to be a disulfiram apologist, um, because certainly it does have its, um, these side effects are real and significant and worth and not, and should not be overlooked. Um, but at the same time, there are other facets of disulfiram that make it very interesting. And there are ways to, that people who, people who have used it successfully report benefits from disulfiram that I don't think are much on anybody's radar. This is a small but small and slowly growing field that recognized that disulfiram actually reduces cocaine use and cocaine craving in people that don't have alcohol use issues. So independently, disulfiram seems to be um, reducing craving for cocaine and also reducing craving for alcohol. 
um, there are two factors, at least for the alcohol, there are two factors for reducing craving. But one of the factors is related to the action at, at dopamine beta hydroxylase, which is an enzyme that converts dopamine to norepinephrine in the tyrosine neurotransmitter synthesis pathway. The result is that there's going to be less norepinephrine and more dopamine, and that could improve reward sensitivity um, and other sorts of interesting things. Also can maybe cause psychosis, and certainly reports of psychosis from disulfiram have been reported, and people with psychosis shouldn't be taking disulfiram. But yeah, the craving, so that's one mechanism. The other thing that, I mean, I've heard this from patients who have had success with disulfiram and liked it a lot. Um, they tell me something along the lines of, once I took disulfiram, I knew at a very deep level, I could not drink alcohol anymore. And so then they would say that they would go about their day and those times or those cues, those times of day when they would think about alcohol or driving past the corner on which they used to turn to go to the liquor store, all those little subtle clues that got them thinking and ruminating about alcohol um, were pretty pretty soon lost their power because as soon as they started to think a little bit about it, then came, oh, no, can't do that. That's out of the question. So it kind of gave them a, a tool to cut out the association between an environmental cue, a cue and the ruminations that go along with craving. And in and of the few people that have talked to me about their self disulfiram experience and told me about that, um, it happened pretty rapidly for them. So um, can be helpful for some people. And interestingly, I mean, naysayers about Dalsilfram will constantly point out that versus placebo, it doesn't really work any better. But Messamore wants to point out that you cannot ever do a placebo controlled trial on Dalsilfram because in a placebo controlled trial, you have to tell everybody you might get a pill which could cause you to be very ill if you drink. Therefore, nobody's on a placebo because everybody knows they're taking a medicine which might make them ill. And there's no difference then between a, you know, a, a black box disulfiram and a black box placebo pill. So um, we don't really have a great way to assess efficacy of drugs outside of traditional placebo controlled trials. And just want to mention that's a curious phenomenon about disulfiram. So I, in my view, I think it's not the best of all medicines, certainly is massively useful for some people. And I think that um, because it was used, developed in the 1950s, was associated with the idea of we're going to, this is a punishment, we're going to deliberately cause you to have aversive side effects, um, has a whole lot of, it has extra negative emotion around it that maybe it's not entirely needed. Um, antidepressants, just want to point out, since I mentioned a few times the APA guidelines, APA says don't use them unless there is a comorbid disorder for which they are indicated. Also, I want to point out to anybody listening, there's a pretty high, it's pretty substantial comorbidity between bipolar disorder and alcohol use disorder. And so prescribing antidepressants, particularly for things like anxiety or like peri withdrawal, depressed mood, uh, might, be, might be a way of pharmacologically discovering people who are bipolar disorder, and that's not going to be good. So um, if truly indicated, then they are recommended, but um, not recommended as a, like a first line treatment for the AUD itself. So to conclude, sorry, I went more than the 15 minutes I planned, but um, my, my final statement reiterates my first statement that alcohol use disorder is multifaceted and treatment should be multifaceted. I talked about medications and maybe said some nice things about them, um, some things that are encouraging about using them, but I want to really clearly pound the table that medications are just never to be used as a monotherapy, almost for anything, but especially for something as complicated and multifaceted as alcohol use disorder. Um, and conversely, I think... <laughs> Editorially, um, I think the idea that monotherapy with psychosocial interventions or 12-step programs is equally bad. Um, they work for, a, it certainly works for, minor, for a group of people, a statistical minority of people, and uh, we, shouldn't, uh, we, should, we shouldn't discourage people from exploring medications when they're indicated, and as prescribers, we should um, continue to think about medication options to assist somebody with a substance use disorder to improve their odds for longer term recovery 
and um, getting on with our life. Okay, thank you.